thank you all so much for coming. I'm just thrilled that we have such a great attendance. I'm Kelly Fry. I'm editor of The Oklahoman. We have devoted inches upon inches upon pages upon pages to this cause. It is affecting our state at every level, from our uh, mental health to our prison overcrowding to our foster care system to domestic violence. We have to do better. And I believe the people in this room can bring about a lot of that change. Let me thank our sponsors really quick. Um, Arcadia Trails, Integris Arcadia Trails Center for Addiction Recovery. Uh, a, a project very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have to give a, a shout out to my teammates on that, Reggie Witten, Terry White, and Dr. Krishna. Uh, also, uh, we have Witten Burridge Law Firm, we have FATE, Fighting Addiction Through Education. You'll be learning more about that later. We have Nix Patterson. We have Bob Howard. Bob's been very helpful and, and very active in this space. I have to give a shout out real quick to Sarah Berry and the two Janines, Janine South and Janine Bella. They put together the trade show for us and we really appreciate that. Um, I, there are too many of you that I need to recognize and introduce, and in the essence of time, let me give one blanket thank you. Thank you for being here, all of you, and thank you for being instrumental in making this happen. Um, I could give you a lot of statistics. Um, I could talk a long time about the impacts of this in our state, but I think it might be a little more powerful. Um, I would like for you to take the hourglass, well, actually it's 30 minutes, uh, in the center of your table and flip it over. Ready? Everybody flip it over. Before the sand in that hourglass reaches the bottom, four more people in America will die of an overdose. So keep that in mind. It's eight people an hour. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. We've assembled some great speakers today to dig into this issue. Uh, we have Dr. Andrew Kolodny, and we have Gary Mendel, and we have our own Terry White, our fierce commissioner of mental health. Uh, first up this morning is Dr. Kolodny. Kolodny is one of the nation's leading experts on the prescription opioid and heroin crisis. He is co-director of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Kolodny previously served as Chief Medical Officer for Phoenix House, a national nonprofit addiction treatment agency, and Chair of Psychiatry at, boy, I don't know how to say that, Momondi's Medical Center, <laughs> should have asked, uh, in New York City. Kolodny helped develop and implement multiple programs, including citywide buprenorphine programs, naloxone overdose prevention programs, and emergency room-based screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, commonly known as ESPERT. Dr. Kalani, we welcome you here today. Thank you for coming to Oklahoma. I just met Dr. Kalani this morning, and I can tell you he's one of my good friends already. Andrew. It's a, a pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to talk with you all about the opioid crisis. Uh, let me just go back for a sec. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Reggie Witten for uh, roping me uh, into participating in this event and um, for all of the advocacy work that, that he does on this issue. Um, so I'm gonna go very quickly. I know that there was no coffee here, so I hope you had your coffee before you came because um, I, I do have a lot to say and, and I'm gonna go fast. Uh, let me start by saying something that should be obvious, but um, unfortunately it isn't. Uh, and it's not even obvious to doctors who prescribe opioids. A lot of them don't know what I'm about to tell you. Uh, when we talk about drugs like hydrocodone and oxycodone that are in Vicodin and Oxycontin, the most commonly prescribed opioids in, in the United States, we're talking about drugs that are literally made from opium. You start with opium to make those medications and, and what you're doing when you make those medications is you're taking the opium 
and you're converting it chemically into a more potent form that gets into the brain faster. We call hydrocodone and oxycodone semi-synthetic. Semi-synthetic because you start with something natural, opium, to, to make them. Heroin is also semi-synthetic. To make heroin, you start with opium, as everybody knows, and when you're making heroin out of opium, you're doing the same thing. You're converting it into a more potent form that gets into the brain faster. And you know, the effects that heroin and oxycodone and hydrocodone produce in the brain are indistinguishable. An experienced heroin user can't tell one from the other. This was a, they did a study at Columbia University where they gave experienced heroin users different opioids to try in, a, in a, like a lab setting. It was kind of like a blind taste test where they didn't tell them which was which. And then they asked them, which did you like the best? And in that study, the oxycodone actually beat out the heroin. My point is that when we talk about opioid pain medicines, we're essentially talking about heroin pills. Now, to make such a strong statement doesn't mean that doctors should never prescribe opioids. These are essential medicines for treating pain at the end of life. They play a really important role when used for a couple of days after major surgery. But unfortunately, the bulk of the prescribing in the United States, the bulk of our consumption, is not for end-of-life care or a few days after major surgery. The bulk of the consumption, the bulk of the prescribing is for conditions where the opioids may be more likely to harm the patient than help the patient. Now this is an old slide. The CDC came out with this slide in 2010. There was a three-year lag in the data. Um, so they were showing you the rate of overdose deaths in the United States up till 2007. And when CDC started to show this slide in 2010, they had started referring to the opioid crisis using the term epidemic. And when they began using the term epidemic, the CDC got criticized. And the criticism was coming from these pain groups that were getting money from drug companies that make opioids. The pain groups told the CDC, stop calling this an epidemic, it's not an epidemic. You're exaggerating, and if you keep calling it an epidemic, you're gonna scare doctors, and they won't want to treat pain, and they'll stop prescribing, so knock it off. The CDC responded to the critics by saying, we're the CDC, we don't use the term epidemic lightly. This is an epidemic. And then they went even further, they said, not only is this a drug addiction epidemic, it's the worst drug addiction epidemic in United States history. And that's the point they're making with this slide. If you look at the box that says heroin on the left, that's showing you the rate of drug overdose deaths during the height of the heroin epidemic. And then if you look to the right, the box that says cocaine, that's the crack cocaine epidemic. And you're, you can see the rate of drug overdose deaths during the height of that epidemic. And you can see what's happened since in 2007, there were more overdose deaths than, than at the height of the heroin and crack cocaine epidemics combined. Now, I mentioned this slide was old, so let me show you what's happened since 2007. In 2008, it went up again. In 2009, it went up. 2010, 11, 12, 2013, 14, 15, 16, we just got the 2017 data. It's now, uh, I think, I believe it's 74,000 deaths in 2017. So it went up again even after I made this slide. Every year for the past 20 years, we've set a new record for death from drug overdose in the United States. And then the next year, we break that, that record. And let me just show you the same data in a somewhat different way. This is showing you the change in the rate of drug overdose deaths in the United States since 1980. And you could see how the whole map of the United States has a pink hue. That, that means that there isn't a single county in the United States where there wasn't even a slight increase. And the counties with the smallest increase in drug overdose deaths had an 8% increase since 1980. The counties with the greatest increase 
had a more than 8,000% increase in, in death from drug overdose. Those are the darkly shaded purple counties. And you could take a look at Oklahoma. Oklahoma has counties that are right up there with, the, with West Virginia and some of the regions of the country in, in Appalachia that have been hit extremely hard. Um, Oklahoma has been hit harder than, almost, than most states in, in, in the country, and you can see that right here on this, on this slide. Now, up until 2010, these were the drugs involved in, in overdoses in the, in the United States. And I started by saying that heroin and prescription opioids are, are both opioids, they're essentially the same drug. Um, but heroin is shown here in green at the bottom, and prescription opioids are shown in red. And you could see that up until 2010, what drove the increase more than any other drug were prescription opioids. And so this is what the picture looked like up until 2010. This is what it look, looks like since 2010. And you could see that in 2011, deaths involving the prescription opioids began to level off at a very high level. And you see that blue line for heroin starts to go up rapidly, and then you see the orange line for, for fentanyl. We had this sharp increase in deaths involving illicit opioids, illegal opioids, and this is mostly fentanyl that's, and fentanyl is not semi-synthetic. You don't start with opium to make fentanyl, as many of you know, it's completely synthetic, uh, extremely potent, and um, most of this is illegally manufactured fentanyl. And so you see that there's been this leveling off in deaths involving the pills while illicit opioids took off, and, and the fact that these have happened together has led to a very popular narrative or an explanation for this that's incorrect. What you're hearing is that the explanation for this trend is that you know, the government cracked down on the pills, so the drug users all switched from the pills over to more dangerous opioids that are illegal, and that's what's caused this, this shift. And that's not really accurate. The switching part is correct, but the switching happened much earlier. Um, I don't have the slide for it, but the switching begins at the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. Young people who became opioid addicted were switching from prescription opioids to heroin. The reason that we've seen this sharp increase in deaths involving illicit opioids is not because suddenly drug users switched from pills to heroin. The switching happened at a pretty steady rate. The reason we saw the sharp increase is because the heroin supply became so dangerous, because of fentanyl that wound up in, in the heroin, not a sudden switching. Oklahoma is fortunate. Oklahoma has much less fentanyl than, than other states, and it's one of the reasons why the overdose deaths have not been going up in the same way they are in the past few years in, in regions of the country that have a lot more fentanyl, and you could, you could see how Oklahoma compares to states like Massachusetts, which have a, a very serious fentanyl problem. So uh, this is uh, the overdose deaths in Oklahoma, and you could see that the green line here are overdoses involving prescription opioids, and you could see heroin and fentanyl, uh, the purple and the red at, at the bottom. And so uh, fortunately, we don't have that same sharp increase in illicit opioid deaths in Oklahoma, though this could, could change. So what is the opioid crisis? Uh, you'll, you'll hear it framed in different ways. You'll often hear our opioid crisis described as a drug abuse problem. Um, and when it's described as a drug abuse problem, I think what the suggestion is what people will think is that, well, the opioid crisis is about people behaving badly, taking dangerous drugs, abusing drugs because it feels good and, and they're accidentally killing themselves with these dangerous drugs. And, and the challenge then is how do we get people to stop behaving badly with these different drugs? Um, and that really isn't what's, what's going on. The opioid crisis is not 
a problem of people abusing drugs, taking them for fun, and accidentally killing themselves. The opioid crisis is an epidemic of opioid addiction. And now it is true that some people became opioid addicted because they were taking pills because they liked the effect, and that's how they became addicted. Other people became opioid addicted taking pills as prescribed by doctors. Regardless of how you became addicted, once you become addicted, you're not doing it for fun. Once you become addicted, you have to keep using opioids to avoid feeling really sick. It's the avoidance of the withdrawal symptoms that drives continued use more than anything else. So the opioid crisis is not about people having fun saying, hey, you know, uh, injecting heroin seems like a fun way to spend a Friday night. No, that, is, that isn't what's going on. It is an epidemic of, of opioid addiction. So these are the different health and social problems related to our epidemic of opioid addiction. Uh, more Americans dying of opioid overdoses than died in the 20 years that we were involved in Vietnam. Soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent. A sharp increase in children entering the foster care system because of their parents' addiction. We've talked about fentanyl. It's been an impact on the workforce. The driver behind all of these health and social problems that we refer to as the opioid crisis has been a very sharp increase in the number of Americans, the prevalence, the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. A 900% increase in the number of Americans addicted to prescription opioids since 1997. And I'm going to show you the addiction epidemic happening with a, a series of maps. So this is what, uh, this is three years into the epidemic. I believe our opioid addiction epidemic began in the year 1996. And you'll understand in a moment why I, I say that. Um, so this is three years into the epidemic. This is data that comes from state licensed drug treatment programs that ask people when they come in for treatment, what's the primary drug that you're addicted to? The states with the highest rate of people coming in for treatment who are addicted to prescription opioids, those states with the highest rate show up as red or maroon. And you could see that three years into the epidemic, we had just a few states lighting up as red or maroon. And I want you to watch what happens to the color of the map as we go forward uh, in two-year increments. So this is 99, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. So you could see that by 2009, in every state in the country, we had seen a very sharp increase in the number of people presenting for treatment uh, for addiction to prescription opioids. And when you have a sharp increase in a disease over a short period of time, that is the definition of, of an epidemic. So what caused the maps to turn red? I think one of the best answers to that question uh, was uh, in a paper by, by Dr. Len Palazzi. Uh, he, he, at the time, he was a medical director at the CDC, at their Injury Prevention Center. He was the guy at the CDC responsible for accidental deaths in the United States. And in the early 2000s, he starts to see that deaths involving poisoning are overtaking deaths involving car crashes. He's got to figure this out. This is on his plate. And he figures out in two minutes that these poisoning deaths are overdoses on prescription opioids because the CDC has the death certificate data. So the next thing that Len has to figure out is, well, why has there been this soaring increase in the number of Americans overdosing on prescription opioids? So to answer that question, he did something pretty neat here. What he did was in in orange, he charted out the increase in deaths involving prescription opioids. And then on the same graph in yellow, he charted out sales for prescription 
opioids or prescribing rates. And what he was showing us with this graph is that as the prescribing went up, the deaths went up directly in parallel with the increase in the prescribing. His point was that this is an epidemic that's been caused by the medical community, that as we became more aggressive in our prescribing of opioids, the deaths went up right along with the increase in, in prescribing. That was an old graph, an old paper. This is a little more current. This has been a, a chief speaking point for the CDC on explaining our opioid crisis. It's basically making the same point. The green line on this graph represents consumption of opioids in the United States, prescribing. The red line represents deaths involving prescription opioids. And the blue line represents addiction. And the CDC's point is that as the green line has gone up, as the prescribing went up, addiction and death went up right along with the increase in the prescribing. And the CDC's message to the medical community has been perfectly clear. What the CDC has been saying is that we may not be able to bring this epidemic under control until that green line really starts to come down to where it was back in 1996. I can tell you that pharmaceutical companies that manufacture opioids don't agree with the CDC. And, and I'm not just saying that. They, they really don't. For the, what they initially did, initially up until around 2004, they were denying the association. In fact, scientists they were paying were putting out papers saying that the prescribing has gone up, but there are no adverse public health consequences associated with the increase in, in prescribing. When it became very clear that this association was real, um, they stopped denying that these are going up together. What they argue now is that the green line doesn't have to come down. If we make the pills hard to crush for snorting or injecting, so-called abuse to turn formulations, if we teach doctors to just monitor their patient more closely, so-called safe and effective opioid prescribing for chronic pain, if, if we teach doctors to do it the right way, we can have our cake and eat it too. The green line can stay higher, even keep going up, and we'll be able to make the red line and the blue line go down. That's what they, they've been saying. And they're not just saying that, they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, this is data that comes from an investigation by the Associated Press and the Center for Public Integrity, which investigated how much money opioid manufacturers and distributors were spending trying to block any kind of federal or state intervention that would make the green line go down. And what they found was that over a 10-year period that the opioid lobby had spent $880 million blocking state and federal efforts to, to reduce prescribing in the United States. So fortunately, the prescribing has started to come down. Um, and you can see how we compare it to, to Europe on oxycodone. Oxycodone prescribing in the United States is blue, and you can see, fortunately, it started to come down. And you can see uh, red is oxycodone prescribing in, in Europe. Um, so we've got a very long way to go before we get to rational levels of prescribing. This is just oxycodone. This is sort of all opioids, and this is showing you the sharp increase that begins in the mid-90s. And you could see that, fortunately, it is beginning to trend in, in the right direction. Uh, this is uh, data from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and they're, they're looking at changes in prescribing across the United States. And it, on this map, the states that have had the biggest decrease in opioid prescribing, the states that are doing the best job show up as dark blue. Uh, the states where the decrease in prescribing has been the slightest show up as, as brown, and unfortunately Oklahoma is, is brown here, which means that you know, we, we've got a long way to, to go before we uh, uh, get to more uh, rational levels of prescribing in, in Oklahoma. This is New York data, uh, but I could tell you every state in the country looks just like this. And this is why I said that the epidemic began in 1996. You could see, if, if you're close enough to the front, you could see that 1996 is the year that oxycodone prescribing goes up. And you might happen to know that oxycodone was the first year that OxyContin was on the market. 
So you might look at this graph and you could say, well, the explanation for this trend is that up until 1996, what we're looking at is Percocet and Percodan, which have a low dose of oxycodone mixed with Tylenol or aspirin. And there in 1996, you have the introduction of OxyContin, which has a whopping dose of oxycodone in it, and it's being aggressively marketed and prescribed, and that's the explanation for this trend. And if you said that, you would be correct. But take a look at hydrocodone, which is in Vicodin. You see a similar trajectory. You see there had been a slight increase prior to 1996, but 1996 is also the year that the hydrocodone, the Vicodin prescribing, goes up. And I could put up the morphine slide. I could put up the hydromorphone slide that's delauded. I could put up any opioid that was on the market before 1996. And you would see that 1996 is the year that the prescribing takes off. And it begs the question, what happened in 1996 that changed the culture of prescribing in such a dramatic way? And you know, I think the best answer to that question is found in a GAO report that looked at the way that Purdue Pharma marketed OxyContin when it introduced the drug in 1996. And what the GAO found was that Purdue launched a multifaceted campaign, and ultimately other opioid manufacturers participated in this, focused on changing the culture of prescribing. They were introducing OxyContin. They wanted to do well financially with their new product, as would any manufacturer of any product. But it would have been very hard to do well with OxyContin had doctors only prescribed it to people at the end of life with cancer. End of life cancer pain is not a very common condition. And the patients won't be on your medicine for very long if they're at the end of life. The way you do well with the pharmaceutical product is if you can get the medical community to prescribe it for common conditions and long-term chronic conditions. Then you can do very well, especially if it's a drug that's difficult to discontinue taking. Then you've got a pretty good recipe for, for a blockbuster. And by year five, Purdue was bringing in over a billion in sales on, on OxyContin. But to do that, they had to change the way the medical community thought about opioids as a class of drug because in the early 90s, we knew better, we knew that these were highly addictive, that you wouldn't treat conditions like low back pain with long-term opioids. And the way in which they got the medical community to change the way we thought about opioids was, was quite clever. Doctors would not have been so gullible had drug reps just visited our offices telling us, you know, opioids are not addictive. We, we wouldn't have fallen for it. But we were hearing these messages from pain specialists, eminent in the field of pain medicine. We were hearing it from professional societies. We were hearing it from pain patient organizations. We were hearing it from our hospitals and the Joint Commission. From every direction, you were hearing that if you are an enlightened, compassionate doctor, you're gonna be different from those stingy puritanical doctors of the past that have been allowing patients to suffer needlessly. You'll understand that opioids are a gift from mother nature and should be used much more for any complaint of, of pain. State medical boards participated in this effort. State medical boards, the, the state agencies that are supposed to protect the public from doctors who might be prescribing very aggressively, state medical boards began hearing from their trade association, the Federation of State Medical Boards, that patients are suffering because doctors are afraid of their medical board. Doctors really want to give their back pain patients and their headache patients lots of opioids, but they're worried they're going to get into trouble. State medical boards fell for it, issued policies, encouraging doctors to prescribe more, telling doctors, we will not sanction you based on the quantity of pills that you prescribe or the doses that you give out, but we will sanction you for under-prescribing opioids. And then to go along with their policy, they mailed out a book. Um, so in, in many states across the country, doctors got a, this book mailed to them from their state medical board, uh, a book that is called Responsible Opioid Prescribing, 
But um, the messages in that book did not uh, encourage responsible opioid prescribing. It encouraged aggressive prescribing. The Joint Commission I mentioned had a financial relationship with Purdue Pharma as it introduced its uh, new requirements for hospitals. Um, this is a photograph I took at a pain conference in 2007. This was at the exhibit hall where Purdue Pharma had a stand. And um, at their stand, they were giving out uh, pamphlets on how to make your hospital compliant with the Joint Commission rules. These were the educational messages. 20,000 CMEs were sponsored in the first six years of the release of OxyContin with these messages. Doctors start hearing that you know, our patients are suffering needlessly, that we shouldn't worry about addiction, it's extremely rare, that don't worry about the dependence, patients can be easily taken off, opioids are safe and effective for long-term use. None of this is true. And we certainly know with data from workers' comp, if you treat an injured worker's chronic pain with long-term opioids, that worker is far less likely to ever go back to work again compared to any other intervention you could have offered them for their chronic pain. That We know that for the vast majority of people who suffer with chronic pain, opioids are not safe or effective. They can even make pain worse. It's a phenomenon that's called hyperalgesia. So the message was that much less than 1% of patients will get addicted when you put them on long-term opioids. That's what doctors were being taught. That this was in, in journal articles, it was in lectures, um, it was in textbooks. Much less than 1% of patients will get addicted when you put them on long-term opioids. We heard it over and over again. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a young doctor, you're recently out of training, you're reading a textbook, and you come across this statistic, much less than 1% of patients will get addicted. And it strikes you as strange, because you can still remember your medical school pharmacology class. And you know that that oxycodone molecule is almost identical to the heroin molecule. How can you put people on a drug almost identical to heroin for weeks and months, every day, and much less than 1% will get addicted. It strikes you as strange. You're not buying it. So what do you do? You turn to the back of the chapter in the textbook to look for the reference. And, and this is what you would see. It says, Porter and Jick, Addiction Rare in Patients Treated with Narcotics, New England Journal of Medicine, 1980. Looks pretty good. And New England Journal of Medicine, it doesn't get much better than that. The title sounds good. Maybe you'd stop there and think it's true, but maybe you really want to know what they did in the study, so you go onto the computer, you go to a website called PubMed, because you want to read the summary, the abstract from this paper to see what they did in this paper. So you go onto PubMed, you type this in, nothing comes up. You type it in again, nothing comes up, you type it in again, nothing comes up. It strikes you as strange, why can't I pull it up on PubMed? You're thinking maybe PubMed doesn't go back past 1980, that, that wasn't it, though. So you make your way to the medical library. You pull out the 1980 volume of the New England Journal of Medicine. You open it up. What you would find out is that what everybody was citing as proof that we didn't have to worry about getting our patients addicted wasn't actually a peer-reviewed journal article. It was this. This is the whole thing. It was a one-paragraph letter to the editor, a letter describing a chart review study where they had looked at charts of hospitalized patients. They looked at 11,882 charts of hospitalized patients who were given morphine or Demerol while in a hospital bed or some other opioid, and they only found four charts where a doctor wrote or a nurse wrote into the chart that a patient suddenly appeared drug-seeking after being given a dose or two of morphine. This, of course, would tell you nothing, nothing about the risk of addiction when you put a patient on long-term opioids, but this is the evidence that was used, cited hundreds of times. The federal government did a, a, a review of all of the available evidence on long-term use of opioids for chronic pain, and they, so they looked at every published study, and the conclusion of their uh, of this effort is highlighted here in, in yellow. After looking at all of the published studies on long-term use of 
opioids for chronic pain, they concluded we can't find evidence that long-term use of opioids helps patients. We did find evidence that it's dangerous, and the higher the dose, the more dangerous it is. Now, if you think about that for a moment, if you think about any medical intervention, surgical intervention, whatever the medical intervention is, if you don't have evidence that it's going to help a patient, but you do have evidence that it's dangerous, those are medical interventions that we should prescribe rarely. But opioids are still routinely prescribed for chronic pain. It's not just chronic pain that we have to worry about. In fact, many of the people who wind up getting opioids for chronic pain started off with opioids for acute pain. They were put on opioids, for example, after surgery or an injury, and they never came off. And when they're going to their doctor every month to be continued on opioids, the diagnosis is chronic pain because it's, it's lasting. Um, but this was a, a study published by the CDC um, to look at what happens with the initial episode of a prescription. And what they found was that if you take an, they, they found that if a patient takes an opioid every day for 10 days, one in five were still on an opioid a year later. And if you take an opioid every day, a few times a day, every day for 30 days, 40% of patients were still on an opioid one year later, which means that we really also have to worry about uh, being more cautious with uh, acute pain prescribing. How do we bring our opioid addiction epidemic to an end? And again, it's not an abuse crisis. The challenge isn't how do we stop people from behaving badly. The, the challenge is how do we prevent more Americans from getting addicted and, and how do we see that the people who are addicted have access to effective treatment? Um, what's a little different here uh, um, when it, from other disease epidemics, because really preventing and, and treating diseases, that's how you respond to any disease epidemic. If you had an Ebola outbreak here in Oklahoma City, what would we do about an Ebola outbreak in Oklahoma City? Well, the first thing we would do is say, okay, we've got to contain it. We've got to prevent more Oklahomans from developing the Ebola infection, prevent new cases. And for the people who have the Ebola infection, we'd say, okay, let's get them life-saving treatment so it doesn't kill them. That's what you do about an Ebola outbreak. And it's, it's similar to what we need to do about our opioid addiction epidemic. We have to prevent more Americans from getting addicted. We have to treat those who, who are addicted. The, the difference here is with a, a drug addiction epidemic, there really is also a role for law enforcement. And you know, I, it, certainly the war on drugs has rightly has a bad reputation because it contributed to mass incarceration and it didn't really work. But there is an important role for law enforcement. You do want to close down pill mills. You do want heroin and fentanyl to be more difficult and more expensive to access because that can help steer people to treatment. If you're making treatment more available while you're making heroin and painkillers and fentanyl harder to get, more people will seek treatment. So if, if, it's, if it's this simple, why has the opioid addiction epidemic gotten worse every year for the past 20 years? I think the answer to that is for many years, policymakers were falling for this false framework. This is the way that members of Congress, FDA officials, other policymakers were being told to think about the opioid crisis, and it's incorrect. So, and, and this was a slide shown at an FDA meeting, and uh, it was shown by a fellow who um, uh, works for an organization that gets lots of money from, from drug companies, and this was a meeting convened to talk about putting Vicodin into the more restrictive category, Schedule II. And he was there making the argument to the FDA, don't put Vicodin into a harder, uh, into a more restrictive category. If you do that, you're gonna be penalizing the pain patient for the bad behavior of the, of the drug abusers. That was his, his argument. And the message to the, that he was delivering to the FDA was, you, know, you have to be balanced. Yes, you wanna stop those drug abusers, but don't punish the pain patient in your effort to stop the, the drug abusers. That's basically the way the issue was framed. And for a while, this worked. 
this false way of framing the problem, framing it as if all of the harms are limited to so-called abusers and millions of people with pain are being helped by the increase in, in prescribing, which was of course never true. These are lousy drugs for chronic pain. Millions of people with pain have become addicted. Thousands of people who were prescribed opioids for pain have died. It was, it was never true that the harms were limited to people taking opioids recreationally, but policymakers fell for this. If you look at what was coming out of the federal government um, under uh, the Obama administration, if you look at what was coming out of uh, National Institutes of Drug Abuse or FDA or SAMHSA, almost every report they issued was focused on the problem of non-medical use, the problem of kids getting into grandma's medicine chest. And just so that nobody would get the idea that opioids might be overprescribed or, or that some doctors might not want to prescribe opioids because of that report, you'd see language in the, sa in the same paper um, cautioning doctors that you don't want to reduce prescribing, um, that these are important medicines for chronic pain. The policymakers were falling for this. That started to change a few years ago. Um, and you are, you are now seeing in the federal government and states across the country a recognition that the problem isn't kids getting into grandma's medicine chest so much as it is the fact that every grandma now has opioids in her medicine chest, that what's really fueled the problem, which the CDC was saying all along, has been overprescribing. We don't have these two distinct groups. There's tremendous overlap. About 41% of patients on long-term opioids will meet criteria for an opioid use disorder. A study that was done in Utah, they looked at everybody who had died of a prescription opioid overdose in the state of Utah in the year 2008-2009. They went through medical records and spoke to family members. They found that 92% of the people who had died of a prescription opioid overdose were receiving legitimate prescriptions from doctors for, for chronic pain. I'm gonna to start to wrap it up here with a few final uh, points. Um, this is the AIDS epidemic. This is deaths from AIDS. And you can see there's a sharp increase in, in deaths from, from AIDS. The AIDS epidemic began around 1980 and it peaks around 1995 with about 45,000 Americans who died of AIDS. And the number of Americans who died of an opioid overdose in 2017 is almost identical. We're right at about 45,000 prescription, uh, uh, prescription fentanyl heroin deaths in the United States. So a very similar trajectory as well. Now why did deaths from AIDS plummet? What happened? Thank you, yes, treatment. We had the introduction of antiretroviral therapies. We were able to turn HIV infection from a chronic disease, I mean from a, a terminal disease into a chronic disease. And we saw deaths plummet. I believe that we could do this with the opioid addiction epidemic if, we, if more Americans had better access to a particular medication. And the medication I'm referring to is buprenorphine also called Suboxone. And if you're hearing me say this and you're really skeptical because you've just heard me spend a while telling you that the way doctors have been prescribing a medicine created a public health catastrophe and now you're supposed to believe that we need doctors uh, to prescribe more medicines to address this, if, if you find that hard to believe, I can understand your skepticism, but I, I do believe that's the case. And when I say that better access to buprenorphine might help deaths plummet. I'm not just speculating. It happened in France. And in France, buprenorphine was released in the mid-90s. Um, and the increase in the prescribing of buprenorphine is the gray, the light gray line going up on the graph. And the, the black line, those are deaths from heroin. You see them really coming down. Um, almost, uh, and you can really see the relationship between the in increase in the prescribing of buprenorphine and the, the drop in deaths from, from heroin. A 79% decrease in overdose deaths in France after uh, buprenorphine was, was introduced. It wasn't a perfectly rosy picture. Um, the version of buprenorphine that they had in France was, is called Subutex. It's the easier to inject version. A lot of it wound up on the street. You can get a high from buprenorphine if you inject it. Of course, most of the people who were receiving buprenorphine were not injecting it. They were taking it as prescribed and doing very well. 
Um, but it was, wasn't a perfectly rosy picture, but from a public health standpoint, this was a phenomenal success. And you know, I'm not saying that buprenorphine is the only way to treat opioid addiction. There's certainly a very important role for psychosocial approaches, for 12-step programs, for cognitive behavioral therapy. All of these other modalities are, are really important and, and, can, and can work together. Certainly if you're gonna take a patient off of buprenorphine, they have to either be in 12-step or, or getting good cognitive behavioral therapy or, the, or they'll wind up uh, relapsing. Um, but I do believe that this is something we have to tr work toward. And let me finish up on just a couple of final positive signs. Um, this is the latest data on overdose deaths involving opioids nationally. And what it looks like, it's too soon to tell, but it, what it looks like is we could possibly be cresting. Um, this is the, we haven't seen this small a slope uh, in overdose deaths in, um, from the beginning of the crisis. You've seen a pretty steep increase in deaths. It's flattening and it looks like it could possibly be coming down. Again, too soon to say, but it, it's possible that the deaths are no longer going up. They're still an extraordinarily high level. Opioid overdose is still a leading cause of accidental death in the United States, but it's possible the epidemic isn't continuing to worsen. And Oklahoma is doing well. Um, I mean, I, I shouldn't say doing well, but the trend is good. And the trend is even better than in, in the rest of the country. So the red line is opioid overdose deaths in Oklahoma, and the gray line is overdose deaths in, in the rest of the country. And whereas Oklahoma has clearly been worse than the rest of the country for, for quite a while, uh, the deaths have been trending in the, in the right direction. I think because Oklahoma doesn't have as much heroin or, or fentanyl coming in, and the prescribing in Oklahoma has trended in the right direction. And I just looked recently at data in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is doing a good job, I think. I think you can do better, but the trend in, in use of buprenorphine looks very good. There are thousands of people in, buprenor in Oklahoma who are finally receiving this uh, treatment. And I think all of this may explain, explain why you're, you're trending in the, in the right direction. There is good work being done here. So, in summary, the United States is in the midst of the worst drug addiction epidemic in its history. To bring this epidemic under control, we have to prevent more Americans from becoming addicted. We have to see that those who are suffering from this condition receive effective treatment. Thank you.